السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ومن اهتدى بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد بيجن بالدعاء اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما برحمةك يا أرحم الراحمين أمين um, first and foremost, I would like to take this opportunity for wel to welcome each and every one of you on behalf of Masjid al-Siddiq, on behalf of the, the presidents and the executives of our masjid. It's incredible that you are making this effort to be here, albeit we start with small numbers, but inshallah, our numbers grow towards Maghrib time as we know how our community is, inshallah. Our program here this evening is very short, uh, well, very limited amount of activities but inshallah hopefully it can be very beneficial for us um, we will begin with a recitation of quran followed by our main presentation by sheikh zakaria <coughs> sheikh zakaria thereafter we will have some questions and i do encourage everyone to ask as much questions as possible um, the sisters a number will be shown on your screen you can text your numbers there and those questions will be forwarded to our presenter for brothers of course you're here please don't text your questions ask them <laughs> and um after that, we'll break for Salat al-Maghrib. Thereafter, we will have brothers will go down in the basement for dinner, and sisters will have dinner on the floor that they are on right now, inshallah. So we'll begin first by asking one of our young brothers, Talha, to start with a Quranic recitation, inshallah. So, Talha. Assalamu alaikum. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا استعينوا بالصبر والصلاة إن الله مع الصابين ولا تقولوا لمن يقتل في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء ولكن لا تشعود ولنبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات ومشي الصابين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون أولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم ورحمة وأولئك هم المهتدون السلام عليكم ما شاء الله الحمد لله it is truly beautiful to hear our youngsters, our youth, continuing in the tradition of ta'aleem, of seeking knowledge, and especially of knowledge of Qur'an. May Allah bless him, and may Allah bless his family, and may Allah continue to bless him to become more learned in the Qur'an and more proficient in it. Ameen. So inshallah, our presenter here tonight is no stranger to our community, Sheikh Zakaria, a youth from our community who have grown up and dedicated his life towards teaching and learning and helping others understand his deen better. He's presently the Imam and uh, religious director for Masjid Isa ibn Maryam. And he is here with us to share with us some insights and some knowledge um, from the, on the concept of trials of the believer. In our times today, it is indeed a very, very, very relevant topic given that the trials of the Ummah are very much apparent to us on social media and the news and it's something that we are bombarded with today and hopefully from this presentation we can take away a few lessons that will help us uh, motivate us and help us to improve and elevate ourselves during these times of trials without further ado Sheikh Zakaria Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah for allowing us to gather here. And uh, our topic for this evening is trials in the life of the believer. 
And I'd also like to thank Masjid uh, al-Sadiq for having me, alhamdulillah. Um, you know, it's been a little while, but alhamdulillah, it's always a pleasure uh, sharing something with this community and just, just praying here and just being here, alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you all. Ameen. So our topic is trials in the life of a believer. So uh, trials, problems that you go through, whether it's domestic problems, problems in your family, problems in your community, problems in your country, problems around the world, we all know that there are problems. But the question is, how do we deal with them? The reason why I chose this topic is because last week, uh, I would say a little over a week, there's a sister who contacted our masjid, and she had a problem. And the problem that she had was that she was complaining of having weak faith. She felt like she's not a believer anymore. So when I spoke to this sister, I spoke to her for about, it was like over an hour, because of how many things this sister was bringing up. And she, you know, I was asking her, you know, like, what's going on? Why do you feel like you have weak faith? Is it like some shubuhat you got? You have some doubts about the Quran, doubts about the Prophet's life? Did you read something online? Like, what happened? She said that she's going through problems. And bit by bit, she kind of opened up to like what she is going through. And she is going through some serious trials. May Allah make it easy for her. But she was raped. She's getting kicked out of her school. It's an Ivy League school. She's like fifty to $100,000 in debt. She's got family problems. She's got a whole load of problems. And it just keeps piling up. And the reason why she feels like she's losing faith is because these problems have been piling up for two, three years straight now. And every Ramadan that passes by, she's praying in the night, she's not going to sleep, she's making dua, she's praying to Hajjud, she's doing whatever she thinks that she can do, yet the problems are not going away. This last Ramadan, she was making dua for something very specific, and if she did not get this particular thing, it would be devastating for her. It would mean that she would waste so many years in school, waste so much money, waste so many years of her life, and that's exactly what happened, is that she was making dua for that particular thing in Ramadan, and right after Ramadan, it didn't go through. It didn't go through. So imagine somebody being in this situation. Maybe some of us have never been in this kind of situation before, where you're like violated from every angle. So for her, you know, she feels like if she makes dua, if she prays, you know, she feels like she said, okay, before her hope level in Allah was like 98%, 95%. She said right now it's like 2%. She feels like there's no point in praying. She's done it so much that now she feels resentment towards Allah. She feels resentment towards Allah. Why? Because she's praying to the one who in his hands is everything. He can change everything in a blink of an eye. But he doesn't. So how do you deal with a situation like this? And you know what? Some of us, may Allah protect all of us, but there are some people who never think that they're going to get into this position, but it happens. And even if we never get to this low, we all sitting here right now are going to go through trials and tests that's going to bring us, is going to try to bring us down. So how do we deal with this, right? How do we deal with the fact that there's evil in the world? Do you know that there is, there is a, there's an argument against the existence of Allah and it's an argument from evil, the problem of evil. Does anybody know what the problem of evil is? It's, it's uh, formulated by a Greek philosopher by the name Epicurus. And he came up with this, with this idea that there cannot be a God because there is evil in the world. Okay, how do you get from there is evil in the world to then saying that there is no God? Somebody tell me, does anybody know what the argument is? The argument of evil against God? Anybody? Because you understand, it's kind of like what this sister is going through. Like she's going through problems, there's evil in her life, and that's leading her to then rejecting Allah. That's why she feels like she doesn't believe in Allah anymore. She's, she's almost there. My question is, how does somebody get from evil and going through problems, evil in the world, happening to you, happening to others, and then getting to the point of disbelief in Allah? What's in the middle that causes somebody to go from point A to point B? Yes. Very good, right? Just to repeat what the brother said, very, you know, that's, that's, that's like, like, we're getting closer and closer. He said that how, you know, if there was a God, there wouldn't be these problems, right? There wouldn't be these problems. Okay, very good. I think we could just, like, work together to kind of, like, formulate it. What's the thought process that goes through a person's head? 
there's evil, all right, if there was a God, there wouldn't be no problems like this, and then, therefore, there is no God. There's a little more, there's a little more that's, that's missing in the middle. Anybody else? I think somebody else had their hand raised, yeah. Yes, right? If there's so much evil in the world, why doesn't God just get rid of it all at once? Now, you guys understand, this is a heavy topic. <laughs> this is a heavy topic, but it needs to be spoken about. And every Muslim needs to understand this. Why? Because you never know if you're going to be put in this position to start thinking like this. And the shaitan is going to try to play whatever games he can. All right, so, so, uh, so the, the, the argument really is, is that God cannot be all-powerful and all loving at the same time. He can be all merciful and all powerful at the same time. Why? Because if he is, you know, if, if there's evil happening in the world, if he's all loving, he would stop it from happening. Right? He would stop the childhood cancer. He would stop the tsunami from wiping out an entire community. He would stop the earthquakes. He would stop the wars. He would stop this happening in Palestine and all of this, you know, stuff ha happening around the world. If he was all loving, he would stop those things. Now, if he's not stopping those things, then either he's not all loving or he's not all powerful. It's either like, you know, one of those choices. Either he is all loving and he just doesn't have the ability to stop it. Why? Because if he had the ability to stop it, he's all loving, he would stop it. Or he's all powerful and if he's all powerful and he can stop the evil, that means that he can be all loving. Why? Because if he has the power to stop the evil and he doesn't, that would mean that he's not all loving, he's not all merciful. So some people, they're like, all right, if there's evil in the world and God is not stopping it, therefore there is no God. And it's almost like this sister is like about to fall into this problem, right? So it's not just like a philosophical problem that you find in some books. No, 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 no. Shaitan comes and he tries to get us down this thought pattern. Right? And this happens to a lot of people. You know, some people, they lose their child and they say, oh, if there was a God, he would never allow this to happen. I got raped, this happened to me, I'm praying salah, how could this happen to me? If there was Allah, why doesn't He protect me? He saves the prophets, He saves the believers, what about me? What, what's the point of all of this fasting, all of this salah? So, so now, uh, you know, another, another issue that we need to talk about is just the nature of evil in this world. Why is there evil? Right? So, before we get into all of these issues, right, let's address the problem since we brought it up, since this is the problem of the sister. The problem with this argument against God is that it presupposes that God is just loving and all-powerful. All but there's another quality of Allah that, that, that if you enter into the equation, it kind of solves the, the problem of evil. What is the quality of Allah that if you insert it into the, into the arena, you know, it kind of solves the issue for us as believers. So Allah is all-powerful. In Allah ala kulli shayin qadir, Allah is able to do all things, of course. Allah is Al-Wadud, He is loving, right? Allah is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, right? He's merciful, right? He's loving and He's merciful. Okay, if Allah only had these two qualities, fine. Maybe, maybe the argument has some weight. But it's not like Allah only has those two qualities. Allah has more qualities. Somebody give me an attribute of Allah that if we bring it into the equation, it helps us understand that this is not really a problem. Evil is not really a problem for Allah's existence. Yes? The all-knowing, okay, but he could be all-loving and in, uh, incapable of stopping the evil and he knows fully well about the evil. Or he could be fully able to stop the evil, he knows fully well what the evil is that's happening, but he's not all-loving. There's another quality, yes, knowledge is, is there, but there's something more specific. Yeah? The all-just. The all-just. Okay, that is good. Okay, all-just is good. There's one more, there's one more. I would say, you know, justice is there, but I would say there's something else. Well, I mean, yes, justice is part of, is part of that. And the word of your Lord is, is complete in truthfulness and justice. Yes, Allah is all just. What else? What's another quality of Allah that if you consider it, this wouldn't really be a problem? Yes? Is teacher like a quality? Like, is there some sort of... Huh? Teacher? Okay, Ar Rahman wa Alam al Quran. Allah is the most merciful. He taught the Quran. That's good, but something a little more specific than that. Yes. All wise. Al Hakim. He's 
إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ Indeed, Allah is all-knowing and all-wise. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلِيمًا حَكِيمًا And Allah is always all-knowing and all-wise. If you insert wisdom into the picture now, then you understand that when Allah does not stop an evil, if there's a greater wisdom as to why He doesn't do so, then it justifies it and it makes it just. Justice is kind of the result of it. Which, which as a believer, we believe in these things as default, right? That Allah is just, no matter what. All right, so... Now, uh, is everybody with me so far? That Allah is all-loving, He's all-powerful, but He's also all-just. So when there's evil happening in the world, it doesn't mean that He's incapable of stopping the evil. It doesn't mean that He is not loving by allowing the evil to still exist. He's allowing the evil to exist for a greater wisdom. For a greater wisdom. The question is, we love our children as parents. Do you sometimes allow certain negative things that hurt your kids sometimes? Do you allow those things for a greater wisdom. Yeah, give me an example then. Who said yes? Brother. I'll say yes. Like, let's say, like, you don't want your child to go hang out with your friends, right? Yes. Like, you don't want your child to do this, right? But you're not going to let it happen, of course. But you're going to tell them before they go and hang out with your friends, you're going to be like, watch where you're around. Watch what you're going to take away from your friends. Mm -hmm. And by them hanging out with those friends, if they're really just to themselves, they realize what I'm doing is wrong. Okay, but sometimes they don't realize it. So what do you have to do in that case? You, you gotta stop them. Like, no, you're not going to hang around with no Chuck E. Cheese, none of this, no, right? So an uh, just to reiterate the example, because maybe some people didn't hear, maybe the sisters, right? The brother, he gave an example. Sometimes as parents, your child wants to go hang out with some friends that you think are bad friends. But he loves these friends. They're cool, they play video games together, but the parent, he sees stuff that the kid doesn't see. Right? He doesn't see that these kids actually, right, they're smoking and doing, they're doing all of this stuff. They're going to be a bad influence on the child. Sometimes kids don't see that because they're just thinking about play. They're not looking at the big picture. But as a parent, you love your child. As a parent, you have the ability to make certain rules, right? Sometimes it's the case that when you do something, when you stop your child from hanging out with the friends, the child thinks that that's something bad. Oh, how could you do this? This is evil. You don't care about me. You don't love me, right? But when you stop your child, you know, when you stop your child from hanging out with his friends, are you hurting him in a way? Does it cause him pain? Of course it does. Are you, your intention is not to cause the pain, right? But does it cause the child some pain and suffering? He has to be home, he's going to cry, he's going to shut the room door, he's going to walk back and forth, he always does this, I can't stand this, right? He's going to put his face in a pillow and curse and do all of this stuff, right? He's going to be in pain, he's going to have some mental health issues, because you're stopping him from hanging out with these bad friends. He's going to think that you are not all good. He always does this. He never understands me. Right? Right? I can't stand this. Oh, he just work all day and he comes home late and he thinks he understands everything I'm going through. Right? That's how some kids, you know, they talk about their parents. And what's funny is those same kids, when they become parents, they do the exact same thing to their kids. Isn't that, isn't that so funny? Right? But in the moment, the kid, he thinks, ah, oh, this is so evil, this is so bad. Now, is a parent doing, you know, the parent is doing something that hurts the child. It hurts the child. The child is, you know, cursing the parent in the, in the child's head, right? He's so upset. But is the parent doing something bad in reality? No, the parent is actually doing, doing the child a favor. But the child doesn't understand that. Why? Because the parent is using what? Wisdom, right? The parent has the ability to let the child go and, and alleviate that evil. The parent is fully loving of that child. But there is a wisdom in play here. You guys understand this, right? And sometimes the child is so ignorant of the wisdom of the parent that they won't understand until years later, then they understand the wisdom, then they do the same thing to their children. You guys understand here? So it's really the same concept. So when you insert wisdom into the equation, then you understand why, why these things happen in our world. All right. So... Uh, so I'm just going to go through qawaid, principles of this particular issue. Number one, God is not just good, but He is also just and wise. Okay, He's also just and He's wise, right? Justice and wisdom, right? Those are very important when it comes to this issue. Another principle is ignorance of a wisdom does not necessitate its absence. Ignorance of a wisdom does not necessitate its absence. Meaning, just because you don't know what the wisdom is, doesn't mean that there is no wisdom. Right? Just like the kid, he's like, ah, you never understand me, you don't care about me. 
Right? You never let me have any fun. You just want me to study and go to school and then do this. You don't even care about me. Right? When you were young, didn't you hang out with your friends? Right? That's how the kids are going to talk. Right? The kid sometimes does not understand the wisdom of the parent. And the kid thinks that just because there's no uh, wisdom that they are able to perceive, that means that there is no wisdom in reality. Just because you can't prove that something exists is not proof that it doesn't exist. And I'll give you guys, a, yeah, I think this is a very good example. The parent example is a very good example. But Allah is going to tell us to do certain things that we may not understand. Why do I got to pray five times a day? Why not four? Fajr is like so early now. It's like, what time you guys pray? 4.30? SubhanAllah. 4.30 a.m. Why I got to wake up so early? It just throws my whole schedule off. Ramadan, right after iftar, I got to go to sleep and I get like four hours and then I have to eat, if, you know, suhoor, I have my coffee, I can't even take a nap after fajr. What's the point of this? Does Allah tell us to do certain things sometimes that we can't understand? Yes. Right? Sometimes you're not going to understand everything. Right? You're never going to understand everything. But just because you cannot understand the wisdom, does that mean that there is no wisdom? No. Imagine there was a locked room. There's like a locked room. And someone, you know, you can't see inside of the room, right? Someone says that, hey, is there, a, is there a person inside of this room? You say, well, no, like, I don't know if there's anybody in the room. I don't have any evidence that there's anybody in the room. Would any logical person say that therefore there is no one in the room? That, that doesn't make any sense. So just because you, you don't have proof for something existing, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So just because you don't know what the wisdom of Allah is, why He allows evil to happen in the world, doesn't mean that there is no evil. Now, I'm gonna give you guys a couple analogies. Uh, the first analogy is the calculator analogy. Okay, when you use a calculator, right? When you're in calculus or trigonometry, whatever subject you're doing, right? And you're basically working the math problem out in a calculator, okay? Imagine like, you know, you're on the test, right? You're on the Regents exam, and you know, you have to show your work. So you do everything on paper you you know do all of the steps right you you know follow all of the steps that you learn in school and you do the whole problem and you get a particular answer the answer is 53.4 that's what the answer is now the smart person is going to put the equation into the calculator and see if the same answer comes up all right your answer on paper you worked everything out you put the equation incorrectly into the calculator but the answer that the calculator gives you is 56 which, which one are you going to choose? You're going to leave your work on the paper, but you're going to erase your answer. Why? Because you don't want to get it wrong. Because you know, at least they'll give you partial credit, right? They'll be like, all right, you showed, you, know, you showed some work, and you got the right answer. Something happened, right? We'll give you, right? You're going to put 56 on that paper. Raise your hand if you're going to do this. The calculator gives you 56. Raise your hand if you're going to put 56 on the paper. That's what I would do, okay? Now, now, remember, you put the equation in correctly in the calculator. You didn't make a mistake. So now you're going to be like, all right, well, look, the calculator doesn't make any mistake. You're going to trust the calculator. Why? Because you're operating based on a premise, and that is the calculator does not make any mistakes. This is a tool that we as human beings have created. And you put your trust in that device more than you put your trust in your own self. Why? Because you've already surrendered to the correctness of the calculator. Right? Meaning even if you get a different answer, you will trust the calculator more. Why? Because you're already convinced that the calculator doesn't make any mistakes. But the problem with us is when I don't know the wisdom, when I try to figure out the wisdom and my answer, I get a particular answer and it doesn't make any sense. In the Qur'an, Allah has defined Himself as Al-Alim, the All-Knowing, Al-Hakim, the All-Just, the All-Wise. But the problem is that is not enough for just us, you know, trusting Allah. We'll trust the calculator. We'll trust the device that human beings have created. But we're not going to trust the Creator. Isn't the one who created all knowing? Doesn't He know? And He's the one who grasps all of the subtleties of this creation. Al Khabir, the most well acquainted. Are we not going to trust Him? We're going to trust the calculator, a device that we created, a piece of metal and plastic. But we're not going to trust Allah, right? Sometimes this happens as believers. So the stronger your iman is that Allah is Al-Alim, Al-Hakim, the All-Knowing, the All-Wise, the easier it's going to be to surrender to His wisdom when you don't even know what the wisdom is. I'll give you another example. Uh, you know, sometimes Allah puts us through difficulties and we don't see the wisdom right away, but sometimes eventually we see the wisdom, right? 
I'll give an example. Imagine you are on your way, you're driving on the highway and there's a lot of traffic. And you're supposed to be somewhere at a particular time, right? You're driving, you're cursing, you're trying to cut people off, right? You're going crazy in the car, you have no sabr, right? And you're late, you're like 15, 20 minutes late. And you're supposed to be somewhere. Now, imagine when you finally arrive to that place, 15 to 20 minutes later, you see that the whole building collapsed, killing everybody in the building, right? And the building collapsed five minutes before you arrive. Meaning if you were on time, you would have been in that building, you would have been dead. It killed everybody in that building. Looking back, if you could change anything, would you change yourself being late? No, in fact, you'd be like, Alhamdulillah, right? You didn't say that before, but you could have said, Alhamdulillah, I was late. Alhamdulillah, whoa, whew, I dodged a bullet there. You know, oh, speaking of dodging a bullet, you know, sometimes when you're younger, you might, you know, want to marry a girl, right? You want to marry a girl. And, uh, you know, you, like you're trying to make it work out and everything, but her father, you know, somehow people come in between you and her and they don't allow you to marry her. Something happens, right? Her father says no, and then people, you know, they turn her against you, and all of this nonsense happens, right? And you're so, you know, you're so upset. You know, sometimes that happens five years down the line, ten years down the line. You will see how she ended up? Or well, it's not just about the sisters, right? I don't want anybody saying that. Because it might happen to a sister. She wants to marry a brother. Oh, he's so religious, mashallah, he's so handsome, and this and that. But then five to ten years down the line, you see how that person changed. And you're like, whew, alhamdulillah. Right? Because they didn't have Instagram then. Right? Now they have Instagram. SubhanAllah, what are they doing? I dodged a bullet. You didn't think about that when, when things weren't working out. You were getting so upset. Ah, you make a dua. You were, you know, praying in tahajjud. Ya Allah, please grant, that, you know, grant this girl for me. Grant this guy. And it didn't work out. So sometimes, sometimes, does Allah show you the wisdom? Does Allah show you the wisdom down the line sometimes? Yes, He does. I'll give you guys another example. Um... You know, we've already given an example of like parenting, right? That's a good example. Another example, this is actually a true story that happened. There was a girl, uh, her name is Hala Atiq. She's from Syria. And this is in the 1970s, I think like 1973, 1974. It happened in the, seven, in the 70s. Uh, her family, they were migrating from Syria to America. And the father left the family back in Syria and he came to America. He came to set everything up, and I think they were going to move to Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, he came to Chicago, he got an apartment, everything was good, right? Then it was time for the wife and the kids to then fly to America, right? So when they, flow, uh, when they flew to America, they, they landed in JFK, and then from JFK, they'll take a flight to go to Chicago, all right? Uh, so, so, you know, the father has, had already, you know, gotten everything ready, and he was waiting for them. The mother and the daughters, right, her children, they arrived in JFK. But before they can get on the plane to go to Chicago, they have to take like some kind of immigration pictures and they have to fill out some forms. So they fill out the forms, now comes time to take the pictures. The officer says that you ladies have to take off your hijab. Raise your hand if anybody, like anybody heard this story before? Raise your hand if you heard this story. Yeah? Okay. So, so uh, the officer says you guys have to take off your hijab. The mother takes off her hijab, the other daughters take off their hijab, but Ahara, who was a teenager at this time, Allahu alam how old she was, probably like 14, 15, she said, I'm not taking off my hijab. I don't care what picture you have to take, I'm not taking it off. So the officer said, no, 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 you have to, you know, you have to take it off, it's just a picture, nobody else is going to see, just me, just a photographer. She says, I don't care, I'm not taking off my hijab for nothing. So hours go by and they, you know, they make them wait and the mother is all upset. The mother is like, what is your problem, we're escaping war. We're coming to America, we're finally here, we landed. Things are so easy, dad is waiting for us in Chicago. What are you on about, what's going on? She says, I don't care, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not showing my hair. So eventually the officer says, you know what? Fine, we'll take the picture, and the picture's online, you can find this picture, right? It's a black and white photo in the 1970s of this young Syrian girl, and she has her hijab on. And eventually, they missed their flight, so they had to get on another flight. This is a true story, by the way. They get on the flight, the whole way to Chicago, the mother is, you know, she's venting. She's venting. Why? You know, why do you have to make this happen to us? Right? When they arrive to the airport, it was like a crazy scene in the airport. Right? It was like, it was like there's so much stuff happening, so much police, so much like, you know, personnel. And when they met the father, he started crying. They didn't understand what happened because they didn't speak English. 
But the father, you know, they're like, why are you crying? And he, and he says to them that the plane that you guys were supposed to get on crashed, killing everybody on board. There was like 270 something people on board. All of them died. American Airlines flight, one of the deadliest, you know, plane accidents in U.S. history. So just imagine, imagine the, uh, the mother, if she could go back and change anything, do you think she would? Of course not, because she sees the wisdom why Allah decreed these things to happen. So sometimes, does Allah show you the wisdom? Yes. But sometimes He doesn't show you the wisdom. But just because He doesn't show you the wisdom, does that mean that there is no wisdom? Now the question is, if Allah created us and never showed us His wisdom ever in our lives, is He doing anything wrong? No, because He doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe you any explanation. لا يسألوا عما يفعلوا وهم يسألون He is not asked about what He does and they are asked. You have to explain yourself. He's under no obligation to tell you why He's allowing this to happen and why He's bringing that into existence. He doesn't owe you any explanation. But out of His mercy, out of His rahmah, He shows you the wisdom sometimes so that you can trust Him other times. Right? I'll give you another example. Uh, imagine, imagine there was a uh, imagine there was a caveman. This is just a hypothetical example. Imagine somebody created a time machine, right? Somebody created a time machine, and they brought like a primitive human being from like ten thousand years ago, right? They brought him into a uh, doctor's office. Now, the situation is that there is a man who has like a flesh-eating bacteria in his hand. And he goes to the doctor's office, right? And he, and, and he wants a doctor to amputate his hand. Why? Because he's going to save his life. Now, is cutting off somebody's hand generally something that's good? Nobody should be saying yes. Of course not. Of course it's not something good. But when you have a flesh-eating bacteria on your hand, what are you going to do? You're going to book the appointment. You're going to call the insurance. You're going to argue with them as to why they need to cover it. You're going to try to find the closest appointment. Why? Because you want to get your hand cut off. Why? Because you know that that's going to save your life. So you're going to go to the doctor's office, and a doctor is going to do the amputation. Imagine we had a time machine, and we brought the caveman from 10,000 years ago into the doctor's office. He doesn't understand surgeries. He doesn't understand why somebody would do this. All he knows is like, what? Hands are being cut off? The caveman is going to see the doctor amputate that hand. Imagine you don't give him any explanation. You just send him back to wherever he was. Right? He goes back to his nation, right? And you know, he goes back. He, that caveman is going to spend the rest of his life thinking that, yo, the future is wild, man. The future is crazy. Like, what? They cut people's hands off? He's going to think that the doctor is evil. He's going to think that the doctor is bad. Why? Because why would anybody cut somebody's hand off? Why would anybody do that? Question, is the doctor evil in reality? No. Is the doctor doing an act of mercy and kindness? Yes. And this is evident in the fact that the patient would even book the appointment and try to, you know, try to force his way in the schedule as early as possible. He'll come. He'll, you know, uh, here's my hand. He'll put his hand out. He'll, he'll fully cooperate. Why? Because he understands the wisdom as, as to why things are happening. So it's a very important principle, and that is that عدم العلم بالحكمة لا يستلزم عدم الحكمة. That not knowing what the wisdom is does not mean that there is no wisdom. Okay, another principle. Another principle is that pure evil does not exist. Is there evil in this world? Yes. Did Allah create good and did Allah create evil? The answer is yes. Allahu خالق كل شيء Allah is the creator of everything. وَخَلَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ And Allah created everything. وَمِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقٍ From the evil of what He created. Does Allah's creation have good and evil? Yes. So Allah is the creator of everything, including good, including evil. Now, is there any such thing in this world as pure evil, meaning evil from every angle? And the answer is no. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentions this principle in his book, Shifa'ul Alil, that there is no such thing as pure evil in this world. Meaning everything that's evil, there is a wisdom, right? If there's a wisdom behind it, that means that it can't be pure evil. Meaning there is some goodness that Allah wants to bring about by the existence of this evil. Every evil in this world, Allah is intending a goodness to bring that goodness about through this evil. That's the wisdom. That's what it means that for there to be a wisdom behind this evil, right? So every evil that happens in this world, there's some hikmah, there's some wisdom, there's some goodness that Allah wants to bring about through this evil. So that means that pure evil does not exist. Meaning something being evil from every single angle. 
question. Is Iblis evil? You can answer the question. Yes, okay. Is he pure evil from, like meaning his existence, the fact that he exists, is that purely evil for him to exist? No. There's some masalih, there's some benefits that come about from his existence. Let's list them. What are some good things that come about because Iblis exists? Yes. You get to train your Iman. Very good, right? You have something to fight against. Right? You have the devil to, to overcome. And when you overcome that evil, that's like a test that you go through. It purifies you, it makes you better, raises your ranks. Okay, what's another wisdom? He, he taught us to do what to protect us from him. Uh, yes, yes, he did. <laughs> Maybe that's, you know, that's something that did happen, right? Uh, in the hadith of Bukhari, the hadith of Abu Hurairah. He told Abu Hurairah that before you go to sleep, recite Ayatul Kursi. So, I mean, that is, that, <laughs> that does come about, yes. What's another hikmah, what's another wisdom as to behind the existence of shaitan? Can we learn from shaitan? Like meaning how not to be like him? Yes, it's a bad example for us not to follow, right? Meaning how many believers when they understand the story of Adam and, and Iblis, they see how arrogant Iblis was, they're like, subhanAllah, I did the same thing in my job. My boss just hired somebody who I think has less experience than I am, that, than I have. And I was arrogant towards that person. That's what Iblis did. Iblis did not like Adam. He thought he was better than Adam. Why? Because Iblis was created in, in a certain way and Adam was created in a certain way. Some people are racist. And then when they learn about Iblis and his racism, right? The race of the jinn being better than the race of the human beings. That, that provides a, a good result, right? You learn how not to be when you learn about Iblis. So are, are, are there masalih? Are they benefits and wisdoms behind the existence of Iblis? Yes, even Iblis. And the reason why I chose Iblis is because he's the worst, he's the worst form, you know, he's the worst form of evil that we could talk about. That means if there are reasons, good reasons for him to exist, that means everything else has also good reasons. Okay, uh, so, so the question is, is that what are, some, what are some wisdoms behind evil existing in general? Right? We said there's no such thing as pure evil. There's always a hikmah, a wisdom. Okay, when we talk about uh, evil, there, there are different kinds of evil. There, there's natural evil, like evil that just happens. For example, tsunamis, these things, people call them evil, right? They're bad things that happen, right? And it's not the result of anybody doing it, right? Like a tree just falls on your house, killing everybody in, in the house. A hurricane passes, kills, you know, a whole neighborhood, right? Uh, or a tsunami. We call these things evil, these things are bad, but it's not necessarily like based on free will. Another kind of evil is the evil that comes about through volition, through free, free will, right? Like somebody coming in, raping you, like in, in the example of the sister that I mentioned earlier, right? She was raped, and because of that, it's leading to, ha uh, to her having low iman. Let's list some wisdoms behind natural evil. Like meaning, are you got a flat tire, there's traffic, nobody really causes traffic, it just happens, right? You fall, you sprain your ankle, right? What are some wisdoms as to why these masaib, why these calamities happen? Let's list them. I have a list of 11 of them, right? That if you guys don't mention, we'll list them. But I want, I want us to work together. What are some wisdoms as to why there are natural evil things that happen to us? Yes? It's humbling, very good. You know like the earthquake that happened, uh, what is it, a little over a month ago, right? The couple of earthquakes that happened in that day. It's like a reminder, subhanAllah, the house is shaking. You hear about an earthquake happening somewhere in the world, you see like how this destroyed the entire neighborhood, the entire community, the entire city just got leveled by the tsunami. It's a reminder of how weak and humble we have to be, right? That's very good, I like that a lot. So sometimes we think we're on top of the world. But as soon as you sprain your ankle, you realize, subhanAllah, imagine if this happened again. Imagine if something worse happened. Right? I think I'm so powerful and so invincible, and something so small can bring me down. That's very good. What's another wisdom as to why Allah you know, brings these things into existence? Teach you patience. How so? Yeah. Okay, very good. Like, you know, a lot of people, when they go through tests in life, it makes them stronger, right? So it makes you stronger, it makes your character stronger. Why? Because to survive through those things, you know, you have to be a strong person. 
right? You know, sometimes you, you know, people go through tests and they're still praising Allah. You see videos of people in Gaza, they're still thanking Allah, they're still praying to Allah. It's like, subhanAllah, like the sabr that people have, right? Going through these, difficult, uh, these difficulties, it trains the sabr, very good, right? What else? Anybody? That's it? It's a reminder. Yes, how so? It's, yeah, right? And that kind of goes hand in hand, right? But, 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 but this is like from a different angle, right? It's a reminder that Allah is in charge, right? You don't run everything, you don't have everything under control, right? There, you know, things happen to you as well. And you have to put your trust in Allah, right? That He's in charge. All right, very good. What else? It may be good for you because there are things that you think are evil, you think that they are bad, but it's actually good for you. Like the traffic example, right? You were held up in traffic, but that prevented you from going into the building early in which it would then collapse, killing you, right? So, so sometimes it's a blessing in disguise, right? Sometimes, you know, sometimes Allah takes away a blessing from someone and they think that it's so bad, they can't believe why Allah would do this. But maybe Allah knows that if He allowed you to have those feet, you would use those feet to disobey Him. If he didn't take away your eyes, you would look at something that would earn you Jahannam. So it's a rahmah, it's a mercy that Allah takes away your eyes. Or, or takes away whatever he takes away from us, right? So a lot of times it's a blessing in disguise. What else? What's another wisdom? Anybody? Expiation of sins. Hmm? Expiation of sins, beautiful. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, any time a believer goes through calamities, even the prick of a thorn, any gham, any distress, any hem, any anxiety, any sadness that the believer goes through, Allah removes his sins. Imagine there's going to be some people that will come on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Imagine if this is possible. A person comes on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, and because of the difficulties that he went through in his life, Allah removes so many sins that when he comes on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, he sees that he earns paradise. Maybe this person, if he could go back and change anything, he wouldn't. Why? Because he understood, like, wow, subhanAllah, Allah was really helping me out. And Allah knows me better than I know myself, so He's saving me from myself, right? So that's very good. What else? Anything else? Hmm? Good. Allah is raising you in ranks. The Prophet he says the people that go through the most difficult tests are. The prophets, look at the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam going through all of these trials in his life, having to bury six out of seven of his children, his entire community going against him, slandering him, trying to kill him, killing his friends, and going through this for twenty-three years. Why? Just because he's calling to Allah, right? So the more you go through these trials, you know the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says, "Wa inna Allah taala ida ahabba qawman ibtalahum." Then indeed, when Allah loves a person, He tests that person. So perhaps this is Allah raising your ranks, right? Very good. What else? What's another wisdom? Don't feel shy. Say it. Anybody else? That's it. Okay, so I'm just going to list some of the ones that I have. Number one is it's a test, right? It's a test because this life you have to go through tests, right? This, this life is not paradise, nor is it hell. You're going to have to go, th go through tests. So in order to go through tests, you're going to have to have difficulties. And paradise, ala inna sil'at Allahi ghaliya, that the product of Allah, paradise, is very expensive. And just like you, you covet that degree that you're gonna get if you pass the exam, the board exam, you're gonna get certified, and you can do so many things with that, with that certification. The test to get that great certification is gonna be difficult. So just like that, the greatest commodity, right, the greatest reward, paradise, being able to see Allah, getting the pleasure of Allah. Jannah, you know, the test is going to be difficult as well. Another wisdom behind tests is that it's a means of guidance. How many people, all of a sudden they go through a health issue and that brings them closer to Allah. I've seen this with my own eyes. Brothers that, they get a cancer diagnosis and then all of a sudden they change their life around. Allah even cures them of the cancer, but the, the firmness of faith remains. Right? Allah... Allah Azza wa Jalla even mentions this in the Qur'an. ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس Allah Azza wa Jalla, he says, corruption has appeared on land and sea because of what the hands of the people have done and so that Allah may allow them to taste some of what they have done 
and so that they will return. So sometimes Allah puts you through difficulties to give you a reality check. And that comes as a reminder that Allah, that Allah is in control. It develops your sabr and then you get right back on track. Right? This happens a lot. Now can the opposite happen as well? Where somebody goes through a difficulty and it makes them lose faith? That could happen as well. We'll talk about that in a bit inshallah. But uh, another, another uh, uh, wisdom behind difficulties is, is it's as a reminder. Number four is that it could be a means to prevent a greater evil. Yeah. It could be the means to prevent a greater evil. Imagine you go through a difficulty, right? But that's Allah saving you from something that's even more, uh, uh, more evil. Uh, we mentioned number five, a blessing in disguise. Number six is to raise ranks. Number seven, to expiate sins. Number eight, to encourage gratitude. How is it the fact that if you go through difficulties, it makes you more grateful? I don't think anybody mentioned this one. But it does make you more grateful. How so? Okay, very good, right? You, you see the wisdom and you become grateful. But sometimes you don't see the wisdom. But just the calamity itself, how can that make you grateful? Because uh, I should say, it could have been, you could tell yourself it could have been worse. You know? It could have been worse. You could have your ankle, you could have your entire foot. Well. Exactly, right? So alhamdulillah, Allah only allowed the calamity to, to reach this far. Alhamdulillah, I'm still alive. You know, alhamdulillah, I still have you know, oxygen in, in my lungs, right? Uh, one of the scholars of the past, he visited a man in a city called Maslisa, which is in modern day Turkey. It's like southern Turkey, northern uh, Syria. And the man's name was Abu Muhammad. And uh, the scholar came into the room to visit him. And Abu Muhammad was a man who was laying on his bed, and half of his body was cut off. He was like on his deathbed. So the scholar comes into the room, he says, Ya Abu Muhammad, كيف أصبحت? He said, Abu Muhammad, how, you know, how are you doing? Right? How's your state? And the man, Abu Muhammad, he's, you know, half of his body is cut off. He says, Alhamdulillah, I'm living in Allah's blessing. I'm living in Allah's blessing. He says, what do you mean? He says, Alhamdulillah, I still have oxygen in my lungs. I'm still able to make dua. And all I want is for Allah to take my soul in a state of iman. Imagine that. That's looking at the glass is half full, right? So no matter what, there, there, there are a lot of things that you, you know, gratitude that you can take it out of a calamity. Another wisdom is that it makes us humble. Number 10 is it strengthens us. And number 11, sometimes Allah brings about these calamities to punish people. Does Allah also bring about these calamities to punish people? Yes. Give me some examples. When you wrong yourself. Hmm? You wrong your own self. When you wrong yourself. Some of the salaf... Some of the early Muslims, they would say that I see the effects of my sins in my animal, like my horse that I'm riding. I see it in my family. I see it in my business. Sometimes a person might see this. You commit a sin and then later on you realize that, okay, this was for that. Right? This difficulty I'm going through, subhanAllah, like, like Allah is trying to bring me back. Right? Uh, but, but that may not necessarily be like a punishment. You know, maybe that's just a reminder to bring you back. But can somebody give me examples of like clear punishments? From the stories of uh, stories of the Quran, like like specific stories. Yeah, it could happen with hurricanes, but like Ad, right? They were destroyed by wind. That's very good. So, right? That's a punishment, right? Or Thamud, they were destroyed. Or Fir'aun, he was drowned. Is it the case that if, whenever somebody drowns, that Allah Allah is punishing them? No, not, not necessarily. Right? You look at uh, Qarun. He was swallowed up by the earth. That was as a punishment. Okay. But then the question is, someone may say, well, how do I know if Allah is punishing me or not? Answer that question. How do we know if Allah is punishing us or not? Uh, you have to examine your, yourself. What are you doing? Okay, but what if, what if you just don't know? You try to look, you try to, oh, what did I do? Why did I break my ankle? Was it because I, you know, was it the pornography? Was it the girlfriend? Was it the stealing? Was it this? Was it that? Yeah. Very good. It's because that question is a, like you're asking about Allah's intent. And that's from the ghayb. You don't have access to that. Unless Allah tells you exactly why he did something. You can't say for sure that's why he did it. Right? Like the Prophet ﷺ, he says that the plague is a mercy for the believers. And it's a punishment for others. So you have one thing like a plague. It kills a believer. Oh, it's a rahmah for him. He becomes a shaheed. He's, he's a, a martyr. But then for a wicked disbeliever, he dies in the same plague. He's the neighbor of the believer. And that's a means of punishment for him. So really, you're never really going to know. But then what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to be like, oh, well, I don't know. So I guess that's it. 
There's something else we can do. Anybody else? There's a hadith Qudsi, Allah Azza wa he says, Ana inda dhanni abdi bi. Allah, he says, I am as my servant thinks of me, فَلْيَظُنَّ بِي مَا شَاءَ So let him think of me however he wants. If you think that Allah is just punish me, you know, punishing me, Allah doesn't care about me, this and that, you're only going to lead yourself further into misguidance. Right? But when you look at it as this is a, you know, this is a, a means of Allah bringing me back, right? Then, then inshallah, it's not a punishment. Inshallah, it is a means for you to get better, for Allah to raise your ranks. And that's why some scholars, they say, if you really want to know if it's a punishment or not, then look at how you end up afterwards. If you end up better, it reminds you of Allah. It, you know, all of these benefits come about. You turn back to Allah's deen, you start praying salah, and inshallah, it was, a, it was a rahmah for you. But if Allah takes the life of a family member, you say, why me? And you disbelieve in Allah, you turn into something that you weren't before. Right? You, you know, go astray. Then maybe that was Allah sending you further into misguidance as a punishment. Another thing is that uh, a person should always have husn of dhan of Allah. The Prophet, uh, the Prophet he says, لا يموتن أحدكم إلا وهو يحسن الظن بالله. None of you should die except that he dies in a state in which he's thinking good of Allah. So these are all some wisdoms uh, that hopefully, inshallah, if a person really thinks about these wisdoms, you go through life, whatever happens to you, you say, you know, alhamdulillah, inshallah, my sins are being removed. Inshallah, this is Allah raising my ranks. Right? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, وَإِنَّ عِظَمَ الْجَزَاءِ مَعَ عِظَمِ الْبَلَاءِ The greater the test, the greater the reward. Think about yourself as following the, the line of the Prophets, the way of the Prophets. They went through a lot of tests, inshallah, this is, the, this is my turn. And Allah is raising my ranks through these tests. So, maybe we have a couple minutes for like a couple questions, inshallah. Like one or two questions. Yeah, inshallah. Look, I think there's a lot more that we can talk about uh, when it comes to this topic. There's a lot more, uh, a lot more different factors, but um, I think that will suffice, inshallah.